And can you believe that these people had the audacity, had the gall to pull out a knife on us? Really? Welcome to my channel and if you haven't had the privilege of seeing this face before <laughs> Allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Naomi Osei and I'm mum to Rianne and Erin. Now in July of 2021 we made a decision that we wanted something a little bit different and so one month later in August of 2021 my babies and I packed up our bags and we relocated from the UK to the motherland that's right we packed up our things and decided that we were going to move from the the cold and the rain in the UK and embrace the warmer climate of our homeland Ghana and on this channel we're documenting our entire journey. You'll get to see the highs, the lows, the good times, the not so good times, and everything in between. Now, today's video is a little bit different. In fact, it's the very, very, oh, where are my manners? And of course, to all of our faithful subscribers, our YouTube family that grows and grows a week after week from all over the world, we welcome you back. Thank you so, so much for being here. My goodness, I've absolutely missed you all. Um, you know, things have been a bit crazy on my end, but I had to give you an update as to what's been happening. Uh, and thank you so much for sticking with us and being patient uh, whilst we were a little bit quiet. I hope you all are doing well. Just to say, thank you so much for all your comments, for all your messages. Um, it's, it's really, really encouraging to know that we do have this extended family growing all over the world. It's a pleasure to be able to connect with you all once again. And if you are new here, um, please do join our family. We would love to have you. Uh, let us know in the comments below, actually, where you are watching from, where you've tuned in from, and where you maybe even have subscribed from. We would love to be able to welcome you properly. And to my regular subscribers, if you do see new people in the comments below, please do welcome them to the family. Make them feel at home. You know, we love all of those good vibes and that positive energy around here. So let's get into this. So as mentioned, in August of 2021, we moved from the UK to the motherland, to Ghana. But although we've moved there and now we call Ghana home, of course, I've left some really important parts of my life in the UK, namely my parents and my partner. And sometimes of the year, my sisters as well. Both of my sisters do spend quite a bit of time in Ghana, um, but there are other times when we're all separated and they're in the UK and I'm in the sunshine. So occasionally I do decide, okay, let me pop back to the UK to see my people. Because let me tell you something, these people that I've left here in, these, in this UK, I absolutely love them. And so I will pop over to the UK at any point that I want. Does it mean that I am leaving Ghana, abandoning it, never to return? Absolutely not. I love it in Ghana. Forget whatever you may have heard. Naomi, Rianne, Aaron, the To The Motherland crew, we love life in Ghana. And in fact, by the time I finish this video, you'll understand even more so why I absolutely love it in Ghana and choose Ghana over the UK any day. Now, whilst I was in Ghana, um, we received news that my partner's grandmother had sadly passed away. Um, and so, of course, I made the necessary preparations to um, pop back to the UK to be able to support him uh, and the family during a really, really difficult, difficult time. Uh, so I made it back to the UK just in time to be able to attend the one week sit down with the family. And uh, it was the day, the same day that I landed back in the UK. So as you can imagine, I was absolutely shattered. Uh, but of course, I had to be there missing it was just not even an option in fact I changed the flight to make sure that I would be there in time for that event so day one I'm, I'm tired, um, but I'm there. Uh, it was a, a beautiful service. Um, and, uh, you know, so we took care of all of the, the family stuff. So now the next day was the Sunday. 
So my partner and I, of course, haven't seen each other for some time. And we decided that we are going to go out to dinner. We're going to chat. We're going to catch up. And so we had a really, really lovely evening planned. Uh, earlier in the day, actually, I had gone to another event. Um, the president of Ghana was in the UK to launch the Destination Ghana campaign. And I think I'll tell you about that in another video. Uh, but that was a really, really great event as well uh, at a central London hotel. Um, and so we, we did that. And you know, His Excellency came and he, he made, made his address and uh, Ghana, the message is that Ghana is open and ready. We're looking for visitors um, from this year onwards. So if you are thinking about making a trip to Ghana, you definitely, definitely, definitely want to make it happen. Oh, and in fact, you heard it here first, here at To The Motherland, we are going to be helping to facilitate some of that. But that's another video, another topic for another video. We'll talk about that another time. Let's get back to what happened on that Sunday. So I had not been in this UK for 48 hours before the drama unfolded. So anyway, my partner and I, we went out to this nice restaurant. Uh, it was an Indian restaurant. Uh, we had a lovely, lovely meal. And then we made our way back to his home. Now, if you're anything like me, before going in the house, you will sit down in the car for a few minutes, I don't know, to unwind, decompress, relax for a bit before going in the house. Am, am, am I the only one? In fact, let me know in the comments below if this is your practice as well. Before going in the house, chilling in the car, relaxing for a little while. I can't be the only one who does this. Anyway, for my partner and I, that's really, really standard. We do this all the time. We'll sit, chill, chat, before going inside or sometimes I won't even go inside sometimes we'll just say our goodbyes and go our separate ways uh, on this occasion however it was probably around midnight so you know it was really dark outside but you know the, the street is well lit um, and so we're sitting in the car we're chatting and it could not have been more than 10 minutes before things took a crazy turn now, our windows are tinted, and so I can only imagine that these people didn't think that anyone was in the car. Now, of course, I've come from Ghana, where it's like 34 degrees, um, and so it's nice and hot. When I landed in the UK and I was driving to the, uh, the family sit-down, the one-week sit-down, it was snowing. <laughs> It was snowing, guys, and so you know I was freezing. So of course, I had to have the engine running with the heating on high because I could not take the cold that England was offering at that point. So the car's running, the windows are tinted. I can only assume that these people thought that this was their lucky day. There was no one in the car. So all of a sudden, the car door opens, the driver's side which then makes me turn around and I'm thinking, what the hell is going on? Why has someone just opened the car door? At first I thought maybe it was one of his brothers or maybe his mom or something, but no, I see guys with helmets, mopeds, and they're saying, get the keys, get the keys, get the keys. And I'll be honest with you all, I am so confused, like my mind is going a million miles per minute. I don't know what to think. All I know is that some people who I don't know have just opened the car door and are trying to get the car keys. Now, this is the type of thing that I see in the movies or on television. Like I've never experienced anything like this in real life before. And I guess in those situations, you can always kind of imagine what you will do or think about what I would do if I was in this and I would do this and I would do that. Let me tell you, in that moment, my mind was just blank. I didn't know what was going on. I was confused. Anyway, they tried on two occasions to reach for the keys out of the ignition and take the car keys. But for some reason, and I think, listen, it's only God, <laughs> it's only God by those people could not take the keys because it's not hard to pull keys out of, uh, out of the ignition, at least not in this car. So they tried twice. They couldn't get the keys. So at this point, I don't know, I just kind of snapped into action and I took the keys out of the ignition, shoved them into my pocket, 
My phone was also at the front. So I grabbed my phone and I put that into my pocket as well. I figured if they were gonna take anything, I can't afford for them to take my phone because I need to be able to call for help. And I don't want them taking the keys either because that car is not yours. It's not going with you. I'm sorry. Um, so, so I've got the keys, I've got the phone in my pocket. By the time I look to the left, my partner is already out of the car and he's run round to the front where, like to the side, sorry, to the driver's side where they are in case they've already taken the keys. Now he tells me when he gets to the front of the car, he can see that the keys are no longer in the ignition. So he's thinking, oh no, they've taken the keys. Whilst that is happening, someone grabs me. They grab my arm and tell me to give them the keys. Now I have to say, I think that the sensible thing to do, and I'm, I'm being really honest, I think that the sensible thing or the logical thing to do would be to hand over the keys, take whatever you want, it's not worth my life. But I was not thinking straight in that moment. That's the truth. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I, was, I think I was so confused and to be honest, quite traumatized by the whole experience. That was not my natural instinct. My natural instinct was not to just give up and surrender. Anyway, he grabs me and says, give me the keys. I don't know if I responded to him. I don't know if I said a single word. It's all a bit of a blur, to be honest. But what I do clearly remember is him reaching down the front of his trousers. So he's got me with one hand and with the other hand, he's reaching down the front of his trousers. And at that moment, I'm thinking, okay, you have a weapon of some sort. I don't know what it is, but you've obviously got a weapon. I'm in a really terrible position now in that I'm in the car, you're standing up, you're taller than me, you're bigger than me, and I'm in a you know really defensive position. So the only thing that's in my head is I have got to get out of this car, I've got to run. So as hard as I can, I drag myself away from him and manage to get out of his grip and make it out of the other side of the car. Note, I don't even have any shoes on. Like I'm chilling in the car. That's, we were relaxing, so my shoes are off. I get out of the car um, and I'm not wearing any shoes and I sort of run to his porch. Someone follows me round the car as well, but for some reason, thank God, they didn't cross the boundary of his property. So they didn't cross the gate. They didn't come to follow me to exactly where I was. Now, at this point, I am trembling. Like I am shaking like a leaf. I am absolutely terrified because as far as I can remember and see, there's like four or five of them. And it's just us two. We're just minding our own business. And this is all kicking off. Anyway, so I stand in the porch and I am desperately trying to ring I'm trying to call for help I'm trying to call the police but it's like I can't even speak I can't scream I can't shout and I feel like I can't hear anything as well but what I am able to see is that this these guys they're rummaging through my my handbag and I had a couple other bags in the back of the car they're tipping things upside down um you know I guess they're looking for whether it's money whether you know I don't know what these people are trying to do but they haven't gotten the car, so I think they're trying to get whatever they can get from the car. In this moment though, my number one concern and my biggest worry and the thing that was freaking me out the most is that I can't see my partner anywhere. Like I don't know where he is. And until I actually do see him. And when I see him, he has fallen to the floor. And I'll be honest with you, in terms of my recollection, that's where the story ends. When I see him hit the floor, uh, everything and nothing is going through my mind. And it was the most disturbing scene and it's etched into my, my memory and I will never, I can, as I close my eyes, I can still see it happening. And I, 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 didn't, know, I didn't know what to do. Thinking about it now, I know that if I had left the so-called safety of the porch to come back outside, he would have been so, so angry with me because his number one concern in that moment was, was my safety. He didn't know where I was. 
He later told me that at this point he's shouting for me to ask, where am I? He can't see me. He doesn't know where I am. But I can't hear anything. For me, the moment this boy has dropped to the floor, that's when it's all over for me because I am thinking the worst and I've, I've frozen. Like I'm, I'm, I'm completely gone. He later tells me that these people have taken the moped. They've, they've rammed into him. They're hitting him over the head. They're hitting him in the face. And now he's basically surrounded by this, this group of guys who mean to do him harm. He says that he sees them rummaging in the back of my car. He knows that my bag is in there. He knows I've got my belongings. And he, oh, listen people, this is insane. Anyway, the same guy that grabbed me he and my partner get into it and he ends up taking something from him, which he thought at the time was something from my bag because my partner wasn't wearing his glasses. And when he's not wearing his glasses, he's more blind than I am. So he can just about see what's, what's going on. So he then, he tells me that when he fell to the floor, he got right back up because he's just thinking, he cannot afford to be on the floor with all these guys around him. He gets back up, rushes to the car to get his glasses. And once he's got his glasses on, he feels okay. He feels like he's in control again. The next thing that I remember is his face covered in blood and him pushing me into the house. <sighs> this ordeal could not have lasted more than seven minutes, but it felt like a lifetime. At some point I've managed to call 999. And I remember the person on the other end, cause I must've said, oh my God, there's blood. And I remember the person on the other end saying to me, has he been stabbed? Has he been stabbed? And all I could say is, I don't know. I didn't know what was going on. I was terrified, there was blood, there was, uh, I didn't know what was going on. Anyway, when we got back inside the house, I don't know how it all ended, to be honest. I don't know at what point the guys decided to give up and, and go along their way, um, but at some point it was over and I was in the house shaking like a leaf. My partner's face is all bloody. And when I see him next, he's got this knife in his hand. The same guy that held on to me to drag me out of the car and take those car keys. I think I told you all, he reached him into, he reached down into his trousers and what he was pulling out was a knife. But somehow my partner was able to take the knife away from him. This whole experience has been, was so traumatic that when the police actually did come and, um, you know, the, the ambulance came as well. Uh, you know, my partner was taken to A&E in the ambulance. Um, you know, my mum, and not my mum, sorry, his mum and myself drove in the car behind, uh, behind the ambulance. When the police, so the police followed us there as well to like, take our statements. And it's only when they started to ask me questions did I realise how much this thing had shaken me up because I don't know, it's as though I had some sort of temporary amnesia. I think it's a trauma response where things just get blocked out of your mind because I couldn't remember anything. I can't tell you what the boys were wearing. I can't tell you what they sounded like. I can't tell you if they were black, if they were white, if they were Asian, I can't tell you anything about them. I can't tell you what color the mopeds were. Whew. I just know that when my partner hit the ground, I thought that it was the end. And so I was, I was gone. I was absolutely useless. <laughs> uh, I'm the, like, I was the worst witness. I just didn't know why I, I, but the police told me that that's quite normal. They said that it's probably the adrenaline running that has just made everything all cloudy, but then maybe once, once I calm down, that things will start to come back. Um, and the truth is, I, I still don't remember 
uh, much of what took place. In fact, most of what I've told you just now is what my partner has shared with me um, from, from his perspective. As I've mentioned, the final memory that I had was my partner falling to the ground. And then the next time I saw or heard anything, he was pushing me into the house. This troubled me for a number of reasons. It troubled me because a few days later on the news, it came about that a boy had been stabbed to death. Not long after that, a girl had been shot to death. The crime, the violence on the streets of London just seems to be getting worse and worse. And I just think, had my partner not gotten the knife, how differently this story could have ended? How both of our lives could have been lost? How his life could have been lost? And I don't know how I would even live with myself if he had lost his life that night. He was so, so brave. He did not show fear for even a single second. His only concern was my safety. And him running into harm's way in order to protect me. And if he didn't make it, I don't know. I think the guilt would have killed me. But you know something, Just I just, I thank God that it didn't end that way, that the story didn't end that way. I thank God that we were both protected. Um, yes, he was injured. Of course, you know, we were in A&E for almost all, well, it was all night. I don't think I got home until maybe six or seven o'clock the next morning. Um, and, you know, the, the doctor said that he will require maybe about 10 to 14 days or so um, for, to, to fully heal. Like the inside of his mouth was really badly cut up. There was a hole, um, you know, in his in, in his ugh, in his mouth um, where he had just been repeatedly hit. Um, but I just have to thank God because the story doesn't make sense. We were outnumbered. We were at a disadvantage in that they were above us. We were sitting down in this car. Um, you know, there were more of us. You know, they took their mopeds. They rammed into my partner. You know, we were at such a huge disadvantage. But somehow we were at, managed to, to, to get away without any serious physical, in, um, ugh, any serious physical injuries. I think for me, there are some, maybe some mental scars still there because not long after my partner and I went out to dinner again and where we parked, um, sorry, where we sat in the restaurant, we could clearly see where the car was parked. And I remember a group of guys came in and they were, they were just playing. They were, you know, messing around, um, big guys, they, but they were kind of running around the car and I was just taken back to that moment again. And I felt this sense of fear, like my heart skipped a beat. I'm still feeling terribly uneasy about the situation. It was by far the most traumatic experience. And then just seeing those, seeing those guys that day running around the car, they were laughing, joking, they were having a good time. They weren't interested in us. They weren't interested in the car, but it brought it all flooding back. This was my welcome back to the UK. Less than 48 hours after being in the UK, this is what we were faced with. We came back for, you know, again, as I've mentioned to you, we, we came back because of the news of my, my, my partner's grandmother's passing. So that's one funeral to plan. And the truth of the matter is, we could have easily been planning a second or even a third. But I just thank God that it didn't go that way and that we were protected. That's all I can say because it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that they weren't able to get the key from the car. It doesn't make sense that with so many of them and just one of him that they that they weren't able to, you know, do all sorts of manner of harm to him. It just doesn't make sense. But somehow we made it. Somehow he made it. 
they weren't able to stab him. He was able to take the knife, or well, the knife at least that he saw, he was able to take that away from them. And, you know, the truth is the police haven't come back to us in terms of an update on where they are with this investigation. The truth is, I don't expect anything to come of it. I don't expect them to find the perpetrators. I don't expect them to be brought to justice. I'm not expecting that at all. Primarily because there was so little information that I could actually give them. The police did go door to door. Um, some people had like cameras. And so I know that they were reviewing CCTV. Um, I know that they were checking the car for prints. They asked me not to touch the car at first. Um, you know, my bags were outside on the floor. Um, so they helped me pick up all my things and, and put it back. Thank God also they weren't able to, they, they didn't take my purse. They didn't take any of my bank cards. They didn't take any of my money. Although all I had was Ghanaian money in my purse anyway. But you know, they, they, nothing short of a miracle and that might just sound far-fetched to some of you and some people might think oh it's just a coincidence but no I reject that this is not a coincidence um, nothing about this situation nothing about this story makes any sense the fact that they weren't able to take anything from us the fact that they weren't able to take the car they weren't able to take any of our you know any of our valuables and they weren't able to cause life-threatening injuries to my partner even though they had him surrounded and that there were more of them, to me, that's a miracle. Ah, oh, gosh, talking about this, um, talking about this, I'm finding is getting more and more difficult. Uh, in the in the moment that it all happened, I was filled with rage, like I was angry because I just felt, wow, we have actually really been violated. And I'll be honest, I'm only human. I was wishing all types of evil, all types of harm on these people who would just come and do this. I mean, we're minding our own business. We're not troubling anyone. We're, not, we're talking to each other in the comfort of our own vehicle. And all this then unfolds. I was angry. And, you know, I was thinking, we have to find out who did this. We have to find out. And I'll be honest, I just wanted revenge. That's all it was. I wanted revenge because I just thought, how dare these people cause this man any physical harm? How dare they put his, their hands on him? I was really, really hurt by that. Um, and so I wanted revenge. But the, I remember speaking to, um, I think it was my aunt who spoke to me. Uh, my auntie Gina. In fact, we're going to meet her on this channel soon, whether she likes it or not. Um, and she said to me, Naomi, this happened right in front of his house. If you all were to find out who it was and try to take any sort of revenge, they know exactly where he lives and it's just not worth it. And I knew she was right. You know, I remember my partner talking to me and he was, his concern was, what if I, Naomi, what if I was by myself? What if it was his sister by herself? What if it was his mum by herself? He was thinking about the, the people who were more vulnerable in his life. What would have happened? <laughs> You know, this is one of the reasons why I really don't want to be bringing up my children in this place. Because it's so dangerous. Like, you don't expect these things to happen to you. Like, you hear about this type of stuff happening. But when it happens so close to home, you know, it was that night that I just thought, being out of this, out of the UK is probably one of the best decisions um, that I've, I've made because I don't want my, my children growing up in an environment where this is the type of stuff that they need to expect or to be prepared for. Because the, the idea then is, well, how do you protect yourself? If someone has a knife and if someone at any point can just come out of the blue, open your car door and try to cause you harm, how do you then protect yourself if you don't have a weapon? The temptation is to carry a weapon yourself. 
But we've all heard the stories, we've all seen the, statist the statistics of, you know, those who carry these weapons are more likely to even die by their own weapon. So it's a really, oh, it's a really, really difficult situation. So for me, the, the best answer is, you know, just bring my children away from all of this. You know, get my family away from all of this mess because, you know, being in Ghana, we were in Ghana for how many months? August, September, October, November, December. For almost nine months and nothing like this happened. But being in the UK <laughs> for less than 48 hours and we could have lost our lives. It's just frightening, a really harrowing thought. Thank God my children uh, were not with me. Um, they were thankfully in bed. Uh, and so they they weren't exposed to all of this. They didn't experience any of this. Uh, it was just my partner and I that had gone out for dinner. Um, but he's doing he's doing well. Um, he he has healed. Uh, you know he he got over it. You know a lot faster than I did. I think I'm still a little bit on edge. I'm still a little bit uneasy. Um, even when I go to his house now, uh, as as I'm pulling up outside, you know I do feel hyper aware but again i just have to give god thanks because we're still here i'm still here to be able to tell you this story um and and he, i can smile because he's still here as well ah <sighs> yeah i don't know what else to say people but that's the story uh that is the end of story time our crazy experience less than 48 hours being back in the uk being back in london uh, and that is what kicked off. But again, we thank God because we still have life. None of our belongings were stolen. None of our valuables were taken. They didn't take the car. They couldn't, they didn't, I don't know, whatever plans for the wickedness that they had, it failed. It failed. <sighs> so we made it. We are here to live and fight another day. So yeah, guys, let me know in the comments below what you think what would you have done would you have done it differently i would love to be able to hear your perspective on things um and if you would have done things differently what, what do you think that would have looked like have you ever experienced anything like this we'd be really keen to hear your take on all of this but yeah once again guys um thank you so so much for tuning in thank you for listening uh this was by by far the most traumatic experience of my life i hope to never go through anything like this again um but yeah i hope you've enjoyed today's well enjoy is a strong word i hope you found today's story time interesting at the very least um and i will be back with another video really really soon i promise it won't be this long again uh but it took me some time to really get over everything that happened and get back into the headspace where i was ready to create but i'm back um, thank you again for your patience. Thank you for your continued support. Let me know in the comments if you want to or what you want to hear next, um, what you'd want to hear about, and uh, we'll speak to you all again soon. Thank you all so much for watching. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.